So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for supporting Black History Month and I am so excited and honoured to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker this week and for the month, um, Naomi Sese. Naomi is a amazing speaker. She's got tons of experience, 20 years of media experience. She's worked for MTV, she works for Channel 4 now and she does lots of um, promotions and training for Facebook and different organisations. So I feel really honoured that she's come to TFL to speak to us and encourage us in terms of um, Black History Month and in terms of uh, teaching us and helping us to understand and be educated more on the importance of inclusion and diversity. So welcome Naomi, thank you. Thank you. Ah, good afternoon everyone. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for TFL to uh, invite me here. Um, before I actually start, I just want to um, nod to those who have been affected by the Israeli, Palestinian, Hamas, all that, what's going on um, across the world. And, you know, my heart goes out to those people who have absolutely been affected um, by the whole situation. Um, I just wanted to say that because it just kind of like, pained my heart yesterday when I saw a whole lot of stuff. But without further ado, I want to um, continue with this um, presentation. And quite a lot of what I say has a direct effect on our language, on our behavior, on our mindset when it comes to our organizations, when it comes to our localities, and indeed when it comes to the rest of the world. Um, because I believe that inclusion, equity, diversity, isn't something we should be learning at this stage in 2023. It should be something that comes naturally. It should be a lens that we absorb and we actually take uh, on, uh, on board and actually move forward in our human involvement. But here we are. Um, we are in this place where there is a lot of um, friction, a lot of wars, a lot of um, unsavory language and behavior. And one of the things that I know is the reason why it continues to happen is because of the idea of comfort. Now, as we know what's going on around the world, we here are still comfortable. We all like being comfortable, don't we? We like being comfortable in our, um, our environments, with our families, our friends, especially in our organizations. But you know, when we think about moving to a place where we need to get to, if we think about the real movers and shakers, we should think about involvement. No one who's reached at the top of their game has got there by being comfortable. They've got out of their comfort zone. And so therefore, sometimes we have to get uncomfortable with ideas and topics and lenses in order to evolve ourselves personally before we can evolve our organizations. So when we do that, we navigate our emotions through it, and then we get to feel comfortable again, right? So in this presentation, um, there are bits that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. Do I have permission to play those bits, yes or yes? yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Now that we are in consensus, um, so how did I get here? I mean, how did I get here? Not by the cab that was in the traffic today. How did I get here standing in front of you? Um, my journey from starting off at MTV, as was said at the very beginning of this session, um, to being here at Channel 4 was a very kind of like up and down ride. And I'll go through them as I go through the presentation. But right now where I'm at is in a really brilliant place because I always say to myself, I've got to reach further, I've got to get further, I'm reaching for the stars right now. I am an author, a producer, director, I own lots of property, but what I'm doing right now is building the very first smart city in Matamp, New York, um, in Matamp, Sierra Leone. And this city is for girls and it's looking through a female lens. Why am I doing this? Because I can. And the reason why I can do this is because of the things that I tell myself, the stories that we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves stories, um, and those stories we tell ourselves, we actually walk through life with them. And we tell ourselves a lot of things that actually may or may not limit or not limit you throughout your lives. So we're gonna talk about leadership stories. And the first thing is self-talk. You set the tone. You set the tone of how people see you by, when, by the type of things you say to yourself 
the first thing you get up in the morning, the first thing you do say to yourself when you get up in the morning is, what am I going to wear today? Or, I've got to go to the toilet. Or, should I have tea or coffee? And you're actually self-talking. You're talking to yourself constantly. We have this relationship with ourselves all the time. And when we self-talk, we sometimes say things that limit us, like, I'm not good enough. There are no leaders at the top of the, of the organization that look like me. I'm less worthy because dot, 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 dot. Or I can't speak in public. Who here thinks they can speak in public? Put your hands up. One, the things we tell ourselves. They won't take me seriously or my dreams are unrealistic. Well, I'm here to tell you that you've got to think again because thinking again about how you actually self-talk actually can create greatness. Your thoughts feed into your reality and this is the reason why. When you actually think about something, it's an electrical impulse and that electrical impulse just embeds inside your synapses, it informs everything in your body and your body will take um, um, action. And it gives you a visual and it hits your visual cortex. For example, if you were going to say, oh God, it's really horrible outside, I need to get on, up to, on a holiday in a very sunny climb. And you think about, I don't know, maybe Morocco and you can actually see a vision of Morocco in your head because it's hitting your visual synapses. Thoughts are electrical. And then we start to feel really, really excited about it. And as we feel excited about it, we get to a point where we feel emotional about it. And your emotions give magnetic impulses. And those magnetic pulses that are actually around your energy field together make the electromagnetic field. Your electric ma magnetic field, which is around you, moves into an office, a space, into your home, and it gives off these, this information. And the information you give off, people can actually, in a second, understand if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling happy, if you're feeling angry. They just know it when they walk into the room, and they will treat you accordingly. This is important because when you think about people who don't look like you, or when you're talking to people who don't look like you. If you've got something in your head about them and you're emoting that something that goes with your thoughts because you can't help it, that's how human beings uh, um, um, interact with themselves, it will go out into your field. Everybody around you will sense it instantly and they will treat you accordingly. So when we think about our environments inside an organization, we're swimming in culture because you provide the culture in which that organization swims in and people will treat you accordingly. We'll come back to this later on. But we talk about inclusion all the time and some people say, yes, it's great, diversity and inclusion, but what does inclusion actually mean? We know what it means because has anyone ever felt really, really comfortable in a space with your friends? We have, haven't we? Or in your, with your family. You know that people will have your back at some point. You know that you can go, and that's inclusion. That's what inclusion feels like. And when we get to a point that inclusion feels like that, we understand that actually there's things outside our environment that makes us act otherwise. One of those stories is Darwin's story of evolution that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. These are stories of yesterday that you have to kind of like, oh, get to a place in order to move people out and get to the top. That we tell ourselves that it's survival of the fittest or survival of those who can actually manipulate others and those who can't. We're seeing it playing out right now in our environments and in our, in our world. But actually, nature doesn't conduct itself the way Darwin said it does. Not for human beings anyway, because we know that nature evolves in accordance with collaboration and harmony. That's why we have synergy. That's why we have ecosystems. We are part of that ecosystem. We actually work better when we work in collaboration and harmony with each other. But we don't because of the stories we were told way back when. And those stories are not only destructive, they put barriers inside our heads which allows us to exclude people. So we've got to think again. One of the stories that we have been taught in school, in universities, in our environments, in our communities, 
that are actually disruptive to us and our people around us. Inclusion is about creating an environment that allows every colleague to bring their full, authentic selves to work freely and without fear of consequences. And that's true. But what does it actually feel like? When I was at MTV, nobody wanted to leave MTV. And I got there when I was about 21, didn't leave until I was about 31. Because it was an amazing place to be. It was very fertile in, in, in ideas and creativity. But the most important thing is that MTV employed on difference. You had to be different in order to work at, for MTV. You had to look different, act different, say different things. They employed on difference. And it was one of the places inside my career, and in fact, when I talked to people who used to work there at the time with, when it was MTV Networks, that it was the best time because we felt included. But then, if you feel included and you're writing a remit or a strategy for your inclusion, you absolutely need to understand exclusion because it's two sides of the same coin. So what does exclusion mean? What does exclusion mean? It's a state of disconnect. Has any of you ever felt excluded in your lives? Yeah. You know what it feels like. It's a sense of disconnect, of not belonging. It feels awful. And if you're being excluded, then you understand what you don't want. So when you're writing remits and you've only just felt included all your life, you, maybe you're not best place to write a strategy for those people who have always felt excluded. It's a feeling of not belonging. When I was seven years old, I was sent to um, England from the United States. I grew up in New York and I wanted to be a movie star. My mother said, no, you, you don't. You want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person. <laughs> Who has parents like that? <laughs> and so um, she packed me and my sister off to uh, a boarding school in England, and they stayed in the United States. And now you know that the person on my left over here is my sister. You can forget about her. She's got nothing to do with the story. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I got to a school, and it was a very well-to-do school. And it was a boarding school. And because my parents were in the United States at half term, it wasn't feasible for us to go back to the United States and coming back to England um, all the time. So my best friend, her name was the Honorable Amanda Borick. And she said, would you like to come to half term to my house? And I said, yes. My mother used to say to me, when you meet somebody, especially other people's parents for the first time, dress in something lovely because first impressions count. So I wore my beautiful African print dress because I thought I looked pretty in it. And I met Lady Borick, the mother of the Honorable Amanda Borick. And Lady Borick said to me, Naomi, how do you do? And I said, hi. And she said, your dress looks rather tribal. Now, at the age of seven, I had no clue what, the I, what tribal meant, but I did know what her tone meant. Her tone said, you shouldn't be wearing that dress. So I felt very uncomfortable. And my friend, who was standing right next to me, got exactly the same impression. She knew what that tone meant as well. I know she knew because she asked me if I wanted to go back to her room to change out of my dress. And I said yes. Fast forward a few months later, went back to the United States for summer holidays, and I met my best friend. Her name was Jamel, and she's an African-American. And she said, hi, girls, how are you? Did you meet the queen? Did you go onto the double-decker buses? How was it? <laughs> we said it was great. It was really nice. And we're going to go back there, actually, this year, because um, school hasn't finished. But we're going to go buy a Sierra Leone. And she said, Sierra Leone? Where's Sierra Leone? We said, it's in West Africa. She goes, why are you going there? And we said, because my parents come from there. And she said, Africa? <laughs> oh, you come from Africa? It wasn't what she said, it was the tone in which she said it. In fact, the tone matched that of Lady Borick. It said, we shouldn't be coming from Africa. It wasn't a place that people came from. So in my head, my young, impressionable head, I cut out pieces of myself because I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to come from Africa. I didn't want to wear those dresses. I made sure that I spoke in the way that was acceptable. I made sure that I dressed in a way that everyone else dressed so that I could fit in. 
And I didn't realize what discombobulation was going on in my body because it felt like something was missing. But I felt like I wanted to actually conform and comply to the society in which I was living in. It was a difficult place to be, but it was only until I got to MTV that I realized that when they employed on difference and I saw other people who looked different from me enjoying themselves, they understood that I had been cutting out pieces of myself. I mean, that was from seven up to about 21, 22. All of those years, I had cut out pieces of myself. I understood that adversity is power. Those who understand exclusion are better equipped to create inclusive cultures because they possess emotional nuances that are essential for team <coughs> collaboration. And that is what we practiced back then. But then there's something called cognitive programming because every time a child goes to school, they're taught something over and over and over again until it sticks inside their brain that they cannot forget it. And the idea of unlearning isn't quite true. And some people say that racism is a social con construct. It's learned. Yes, it's true. It's a social construct and it's learned but it's learned over and over and over again that the idea of saying that you can unlearn it isn't quite true. I'll give you an example. Has anyone ever learned anything in school in the UK that is absolutely useless right now for you? <laughs> A lot of us have experienced that, right? Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> useless. Nonsense. I don't even, I, I only use it when I'm doing a presentation, just to illustrate a point that we learn things over and over again. Who ever was a brownie or guide? Anyone was a brownie guide? I promise to do my best and do my duty. I even put my hand up as a behavior <laughs> clue, right? Because it's a learnt behavior. I will always learn that. But you can't unlearn it until you overlay it. The feeling of not belonging can't be unlearned. Your emotions can't be unlearned. So when you feel excluded, when you feel that someone's hurt you, you will always remember that. And that's detrimental to teams and high-performing teams who want to evolve and innovate. Because those people who have been feeling this throughout their lives will step back, especially when they feel an environment instinctively doesn't include them. So every team, every person in that team needs to check who they are, what belief systems that they have learned, and how they are actually interacting with people who don't look like them. There's some information that we acquire as children impacts us throughout our lives, and it's worth thinking about the implications this has upon entering the workforce. And this is really important, because when we think about trying to solve this problem, when we're adults, actually it started when we were children. I'm going to show you a video called The Doll Test. Some of you may or may not have seen or heard of it, but it was a research that was done by Kenneth and Mamie Clark, who were psychologists over 80 years ago in the United States. And they wanted to understand when and how did young children pick up racial cues at, at what point? When did they do that and how did they do that? And this video I'm going to show you may squeeze your heart a little bit because this is what we do to young children. And then we start to think to ourselves, how do we actually get to the point where we can actually change all of that when it's already embedded, when it's already learnt and we know that we can't unlearn it. So what can we do? But let me show you the, the video first. And there's no... Um, sound for the first 15 seconds of this video. Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Mm, questa. 
Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Perché è buona? Perché gli occhi celesti. Quale è cattiva? Perché è cattiva? Perché è tutto, tutto nero. E qual è la bambola che ti somiglia di più? That make you feel <coughs> when you saw those children? Sad. When we first saw the video, we saw the children coo as if something lovely was going to happen when they saw the dolls. And then very, very slowly, children of all ethnicities who were melanated identified with the black doll. And you saw them retract. That carries through, through their secondary school, the university, and through into the workforce. And then we wonder why, when children start to actually get self-aware of themselves, and they push back and say, that's not me who you see, that they're told that they're being aggressive, or they're told that you're being something derogatory. Where do you think children learn this? Clearly at home, there is no parent, unless they are unfit parents, that's saying you're ugly and that you are not fit to be part of the society or dot, 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 dot. Where are they learning it from? Media. Media, school, the whole environment. Books, fairy tales, the white savior, the prince, i never saw myself being the princess. They are, so, we, 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 through our language, blacklist, black sheep of the family, black market, all negative associations. They pick it up like this, children are sponges. So if there's anywhere where we need to start, it's with our children. But before we do that, we have to check ourselves because what are the belief systems that we have um, been brought up that we are passing on to them? You know, throughout my whole career, I've understood that we are expansive, that we are so inclusively interconnected that we actually create, we actually create a lot of impact with people without us even knowing it. We say things like, gosh, but it's just me. I mean, this problem is so big. I didn't actually start it. I didn't create slavery. I didn't create um, what happened in the Holocaust. I didn't do any of this. What can I do? And we convince ourselves that you are so small that you can't make a change, that it's not your fault, that whatever, until there's apathy. <laughs> but we are far more powerful than what we've been led to believe. And sometimes when it, we talk about inclusion, it's about including other industries, including other bits of information that are lost in the actual industry that we're working in. So I'm going to include a little bit of science because sometimes we have to see the whole picture. We have a bioenergy field around us. I alluded to it earlier on. And that bioenergy field holds 400 billion bits of information on that bioenergy field. 400 billion bits 
of information. Everyone stand up for me, please. If you put your hands out in front of you, the actual, um, your energy field starts about two inches on your outstretched arms. And if you stretch your arms out, you bang into people, right? We do, but that's your personal space. You can sit down now. That is your personal space. You know when someone's in your personal space, ladies especially, when people, when a guy stands into your space, and what do you say is like, can you back off please, right? You can feel it. You can feel when someone's in your personal space. And that is because of entanglement, that the information that they have around their space is actually now butting against yours, and it may not resonate. If it resonates, you'll be like, oh, I'm gonna stand further closer. But if it doesn't resonate, it's going to have a bit of a friction because of frequencies, okay? And if it has a friction, you're gonna step back and you're going to think, hmm, What's going on here? And you're going to emote something. You're going to feel something. You don't know what it is, but you're going to feel something. Out of the 400 billion bits of information, and that's information that we know and can detect from our technology now, it's probably a lot more than that. How many do you think of those 400 billion bits that we are actually aware of? Have a guess. In numbers, in whole numbers. A hundred <laughs> bits of information. Anyone else? Yeah, it's about 2,000. About 2,000 out of the 400 billion bits. We live in a slither of reality, and then we have the audacity to say we know it all. A slither of reality. And so therefore, when we're walking around the place, we pick up other people's energy fields because energy cannot be created or destroyed, and you cannot have a void in between them. So right now, all of us are picking up information from all of us. And if you take away our physical bodies, that means all of us is all of us. We are all connected, interconnected, and we have impact on each other. And when we do do that and we understand how that actually happens, you pick up great information like emotional intelligence. You start to resonate with how people feel. You start to ex um, um, display empathy and compassion. You start to hold up the mirror to yourself because you are me and I am you. And if you're acting like that, it's probably a biofeedback from what I'm giving you. And so therefore, we've got to understand that each other one of us can actually create the best version of another person that has a reflection of ourselves. Sometimes it's difficult to understand that because we are so taught to think that we're individual, disconnected. And that's how we get to the climate crisis. We are disconnected from the environment because we think that we can actually work in this world without including the environment. So this idea of race, ethnicity, of discrimination is very much interlinked to how we're living today in our environment. We can change our behavior and our language and it informs and entangles and, um, the information through our electronic magnetic fields. And the thing about this information is that when we think, what can I do about it? Well, if you were to raise the level of your vibration with empathy, and we know that empathy, love, and compassion have the highest frequency in our field, if you were to raise that, you affect other people by them feeling, she's including me. They feel comfortable. They feel they want to come to you with information. And that means that you hit a sweet spot. Their information and your information collide together and you hit a sweet spot of innovation. And that's what companies want, to innovate. Because if you don't innovate and you stay still and stagnant in this fast moving world, you will die. Your organization <coughs> will die. So it's so important to include other people's ideas, skill sets, expertise into the mix. And without you even knowing it, you're already sharing information. But if you now get to know it, you can actually super boost that information because you understand that you are me and I am you. And we're here to create a beautiful world. We're not doing that right now. We're a long way from that right now because there are bits of information that are missing from our, in our biosphere that we don't even understand. Just before I go on to my daughter, I just want to give another kind of like stamp to how we actually interact. Has anyone had the feeling or had the experience when 
you're, especially happening when COVID, when you haven't seen someone for a while and you're just wondering how they are and then all of a sudden you pick up the phone and it's like, they're on the phone, I was just thinking about you. I was just thinking about you, how did that happen? But then you kind of like pass it away as a coincidence. Or ladies, and probably gentlemen as well, when you're walking home, you've done this walk, you come back from a nightclub or from somewhere, an event, two o'clock in the morning, you're walking home, you've done this walk billions and billions of times, but this one time, you think to yourself, I'm not gonna walk down that road. I wanna go the long way around home. Who's done that? Yeah, we've done that. Why? What information were you picking up that allowed you to do that? These, these intuitive pieces of information get dismissed because we're not taught how to actually read them at school. My daughter, she's now 21 years old. She came to me crying about two years ago. And she said, Mom, she's a university student. She's just actually um, passed her university degree with distinctions, honours, first class, which is, yeah, I'll say thank you to her. Um, but she said, my friend says I'm being unrealistic because I don't want to live in the UK and I want to actually um, build my own house in Sierra Leone. They say to me, Mom, she says that, you know, live your life. You're young. You only live once. Go out to the clubs. Go and have fun. Go and do your, you, you know, stuff that young people do. What you're doing is unrealistic. It's for, you know, adults. And she said, but mum, my unrealistic is realistic to me. Their realistic is just not realistic to me. So I don't know what to do. And I said, do you. Do what you feel is realistic, even if it's unrealistic to the rest of the world. So she did. She started building her house at the age of 17. And she's now finished, that's, that's, an old, that's last year, she's now finished it. But the astonishing thing about her is that she's not stopping there. She's just graduated and she's now just, and then, uh, forgive the next slide because it's quite messy, but I only just got this information yesterday. She now started to um, get to a point where she wanted to create a nightclub. Because her friends said to her, why don't you come to nightclubs with us? And she said, I don't, like I don't want to. So she started to create a nightclub. And this happened last year. And she got it actually um, um, designed. And that's the beginning of it. How's that for self-talk? How's that for understanding that exclusion can actually be a power? How's that for actually understanding that actually, if you get the best people around you, you can attract the, what you need at that time. And that's what she's doing because she didn't go down the path that everyone taught her to go down. She's far more powerful than what she's been led to believe. And that can be taken into your organizations because the people who look different to you have different modalities, different skill sets, different experiences that could superset your teams, superset what you do in your organizations and put you head above everyone else if you allowed them to lean in. I always say, do not arm women. We have a tendency to give women these assertiveness classes. Be more, uh, <laughs> be more confident. Put your hands up like this and I'll make you feel like superwoman. I say, do not arm women, disarm the environment. Disarm the environment. There's language, behavior, especially male behavior, which is unsavory, which is just disgusting, that should be disarmed in every organization. We saw it very clearly with the Russell brand that happened with Channel 4. That's been going on for years. It still goes on. So we must de-weaponize the environment instead of weaponizing women. Weaponizing anything I must say it, it's a very male thing. Look what's happening across the, the, the pond to us in um, Israel. What would it look like if that was run by women? I'm not saying women are not aggressive or angry or can use um, violence, but statistics shows that we have more compassion, more oxytocin, which is vital for the survival of the human species. So do not arm women de-weaponize the whole environment because we swim in culture. Every single thing that you bring into your organization is actually adding to the culture. And if you're toxic, the culture is toxic. 
And the reason why this is so important, because when people say, oh, we've got to change our culture, they look to leadership and say, write your strategies, write your remits, and everybody will comply. Not true. Because if you take everybody out of an organization, all you have is four wa walls and a brand. And it does nothing. It's the people who are the organization. So therefore, it's you who actually has to change. It's you who have to check yourself, you who have to check your belief systems, you who have to actually understand whether you are evolving or not. I see this race and discrimination issue, not as a race and discrimination issue, but as an evolved mindset and a non-evolved mindset. Because we see that there are lots of people who don't subscribe to racism discrimination. They're on the evolved side. And there are lots of people of all races and all ethnicities who subscribe to the discrimination side. They're on the not evolved side. And if you can see that you can try and get the non-evolved to the evolved, then life would be a little bit more simpler. Because now race, ethnicity and discrimination is not leading us to a place where we want to be in this world. It's playing out right now. So, pay attention. And when I mean by pay attention, pay attention to what's going around you in the environment. And I'm going to demonstrate why paying attention is so important. Please get into pairs and name yourselves A and B. You can do that now. A and B. <laughs> and if you can face each other, face each other so you're actually facing each other. So turn your, you can turn your chairs a little so you can face each other. Okay, A, put your hands up, A, A, A. Okay, A, what I'd like you to do is that I would like you to talk to B about your passions. I want you to be very articulate. I want you to be very animated. I want you to gesticulate. I want you to say things that you've never said before to your partner within reason. And I want you to be, <laughs> I want you to be very, very, very kind of like up. I want to put your energy up. B, what I want you to do is just listen. I don't want you to talk or reply or to answer to what um, A says. Just listen and smile. Nod if you want to, to let them know that you're listening, but do not say anything. There is going to be a point where I say to B, take your attention away. At that point, I want you to look at the ceiling, look at your watch, pick up your phone if you want to, but do not look at A. Completely ignore A, okay? So, everyone get that? Yes or yes? yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, A, talk passionately to B, B, just listen. Keep talking, A. Eh? B, really listen. B, take your attention away from A. A, keep talking. A, keep talking. B, take your attention away from A. Do not look at A. B. A, keep talking. All right, put him out of their misery. Come back to me. Very interesting. <clears throat> now, A, I know that when you were talking to B that you felt very comfortable and you were just getting into your stride. And then when B took their attention away, what did you feel? Rude. You thought it was <laughs> What else did you feel? Rude, what else? A shrinking. A shrinking. Small, what else? You didn't want to talk anymore? You didn't want to say anything? Did anyone? I just started making up things. I knew she was listening. So he starts talking gibberish. Da 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 da. What did you say? I love what I want to say. Right. Did anyone feel that all of a sudden the thread of thought just, just vanished? Yes. Yeah. felt inarticulated. Yeah. You felt like you're juttering, your brain, like your thought patterns were just like. The reason why that happened is because when you are actually talking to each other, you are 
sharing information, information is going both ways, and the person is feeling included. The moment you take that away, you disconnect. When you disconnect, the information stops flowing, it starts trying to judge it back in, but to, it, it, you just can't. So you become very, very kind of like inarticulated. <laughs> you feel really, really offended. You feel not seen. We know that when children, when they are, who, who has children here, little children, right? Or even children who are grown up, but when, when they were little, they would say, Mommy, Daddy, listen to me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And you're washing the dishes, I am looking. And you're washing the dishes, right? <laughs> I am watching. And they will keep on until you pay them attention. Because they instinctively know that if you're not looking at them, you're not listening. This is what happens when we actually um, look at people and validate them. If you pick up your phone in an interview and you're interviewing something, somebody, they instinctively know that you're not seeing them. And so therefore, you've got to be absolutely careful when someone is talking to you, especially if they don't look like you, don't come from the same background as you, not from the same class as you, do not have the same abilities as you do in your perceived eyes. If you absolutely take your attention away from them, they feel it. And when they feel it, they step back. And then they think, I'm not validated. To pay attention is to validate some, somebody. And the most important thing about that is that you're including the information they have in their uh, um, bioenergy field that you could just pick up. And when you pick that up, all of a sudden, you suddenly start to feel and see images in your head that you've never seen before. Because you're suddenly thinking, oh, they just said something really, really true. And you start kind of like trying to compute it. Has anyone ever had that, um, <coughs> that um, experience where you've had a problem and you're trying to solve this problem, probably a work problem, and you just don't know how to solve it, and solve it, and you're like, oh, so you get up, you go out for a walk, or you go somewhere, a different environment. You go to sleep, and at some god-awful time in the morning, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, you suddenly have this moment of clarity, and you wake up. And you're like, oh my god, no, I got it, I got it. And you're trying to find a piece of paper, or you think, I, I will remember, I will remember, don't worry, I'll remember. You go back to sleep, you wake up, and you're like, what? <laughs> Why did that happen? That happens because when you wake up, you're in a beta state of mind. Your brain waves are just looking at, okay, I've got to get to work, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. When you're sleeping, you're in an alpha or a delta state, and that's when your, most, your, your, your mind and your energy field is most fluid and most likely to kind of like embed itself and bubble up into your consciousness, and that's why you get this moment of clarity. And so it's really important to understand that when you're talking to someone, that also happens you suddenly find gold dust in the air. You suddenly find innovation that could solve your problems, your team problems, your organizational problems, your managerial problems. And that's just absolutely invaluable. So I always say, number eight, go pirate. Go pirate. Break the rules, <coughs> but replace them with new ones. Break the rules but replace them with new ones. I have an example of this very recently with me in Channel 4. I had um, a direct line manager who was issuing out one too many microaggressions. Now, the microaggressions, I don't actually call any kind of aggression micro, because we knew, do know in science that small little paper cut microaggressions, as they call it, can actually lead to PTSD, so that's verbal violence. It's not microaggressions at all. But she was just issuing out one too many. I went to the director of inclusion and to the CEO and asked for the organizational chart to be moved, to change. That I actually could become underneath the director of inclusion instead of underneath operations. And the reason why is because it was a business prerogative. If I'm underneath operations, even though I'm inside on the commissioning floor, it kind of like filtered all the things that I was doing because of the mindset of the person who was my direct line manager. And so it's changed. Break the rules and replace them with better ones. Now, streamlined information that comes from the director of inclusion comes directly to me and it goes directly to the director of um, commissioning. And it flows much better. Break the rules and replace them with better ones. And for all of this to happen, 
for all of your personal development, development of your organization, development of your team, you as a manager, you as a leader, whether you're a leader in your home or a leader of a, of a FTSE 100 company, have to be certain. How many of you know yourselves really, really well? Put your hands up. <laughs> Is this a trick question, eh? <laughs> Great. Um, let me give you a scenario. You've just got home from work, you're really, really tired, you've turned on the television and there it is, Dead Enders. For those of you who really like it. <laughs> it's East Enders for those of you who really like it. <laughs> you're watching it and um, your, your friend rings up and says, you know what, there's an event down the road and it's brilliant, you've got to go because there's going to be A, B and C there and they're going to give you that opportunity that you've been waiting for. And you oh no, I've just gone into my pyjamas, I'm watching Dead Enders, I'm comfortable. I like being comfortable. And your friend said, no, come on, don't be lazy, just get up. Come with me at least anyway, because it's going to be really, really, really good. And then you reluct reluctantly concede. And you get up and you're like, oh God, okay. And you drag yourself out. Who's done that for their friends? Who dragged yourself out? And you open a door. The moment you open the door, you get this dreaded feeling in the pit of your stomach that something was going to go wrong. You ignore it. You go out. You have fun. You speak to people. You meet people. But then <coughs> something does go wrong. And you say, I knew it. I knew I should have stayed at home. I knew, I should, I knew it was going to go wrong. I just, I just knew it. Who's done that? Who's ever said themselves? Yeah. <laughs> Question. If you knew it, why did you do it? If you knew it, why did you do it? Now, you may say to me, because that was my best, best friend, you may have an attack of FOMO, fear of missing out. You may actually have thought, actually, I think I probably would have by, um, enjoyed this. All of those are true. But the real reason I suggest is because the person who convinced you to go out was more certain than you were of staying in. And the one who's most certain wins every time. Think of the argument with your spouse last night. <laughs> Or with your children, <laughs> or with your children, or with your friend, or with your manager, or with the director, or anyone in C-suite. The one who's most certain wins. So be certain in your journey of excellence. Be certain of who you are and what you want to believe in. Be certain that the things that have actually limited you can no longer limit you because you now are aware of how you can actually change. Be certain when you stand in your space so that everyone around you can actually have the permission to stand in their space too. And together you actually intermingle information to take you all to the next level. Just be certain. And the tenth one is thought leadership. I've always thought, what does it mean by thought leadership? How does one get led by thought when thought is intangible? What does it actually mean? Especially if you think about the th fact that we have habits of thoughts. We have language that we say every single day. I mean, we don't actually open up the dictionary every day and say, I'm going to use a new word today. We use the same words over and over and over again. So we think the same thoughts, we use the same language, and we do the same things over and over and over again. So how can we create something new if we're doing all of this? We're actually doing the things and regurgitating information instead of inventing new ones. And that's why, actually, the new types of inventions are very far and few between. We innovate rather than invent because we're using the same modalities, the same language, the same behaviors over and over again. So how can you lead by thought? Well, you can lead by thought by thinking something different. Because when we are actually thinking, we're living in the past. We're, li we're taking out information from the past and we're bringing it to the forward and we think that is the new thing. But it leads to a predictable future. You will get more or less the same if you do the same things over and over again. For example, everyone cross your arms. Now, try crossing them the other way. <laughs> Have to think about that, right? Because you're not used to doing that. Your brain has already said in your neurology, don't worry, I've got this, we do it this way, right? 
But the moment you actually start to make your brain elastic and you do it the other way, for example, when you get up in the morning and you're putting on your trousers, you always put on the same leg. Yeah. Why don't you put on the other leg? <laughs> Try it tomorrow morning because that will force your brain to be more elastic and think new things, right? So to be led by thought, thought leadership underpins innovation because when you include other people's ideas, skill sets, expertise, mindset, lenses, it collides with your own information and then you start to create something new because it's new information to you. And then when you actually convince somebody with certainty, you win. And that's leading by thought. It neurologically changes the way we see ourselves and cognitively changes our behavior. And I want to leave you with this. What if, what if there was no such thing as racism, prejudice or discrimination on any grounds? What if all four corners of the world understood that we are one human race with remarkable power that we haven't even begun to tap into, that we can actually solve the wicked problems like climate crisis or poverty or hatred? What if we suddenly decided to switch into a quantum leap, leap of thinking that we raised our energies all together and we felt good about who we were? What if we shared more? And so therefore everyone on this planet was able to live comfortable in their skin and in their environment. And now we innovate something that we've never seen before because we all have actually got the same equitable access to resources. What if we did that? It can only start with you, each and every one of you, tonight, in your homes, in your organizations, with your families, with your kids, with your friends. Learn more. Go and find a new book that actually teaches you more about who you are because you're far more powerful than what you've been led to believe. Don't believe your school, your secondary school especially, <laughs> archaic information. There's new information that we need to actually um, um, pick up. AI is coming really, really quickly. And if we don't actually, we are part of the AI, we created it. So therefore we are beyond it. We need to now start to tap into that. I always say to people that nothing in life has any meaning but the meaning you give it. My name's Naomi Sese. Thank you very much.